Hello, everyone. Welcome back uh, to, well, if you're watching this recorded, welcome for the first time, perhaps. But we are going to get started with our next workshop for Codebreak uh, Summer 2017, which is making a web application. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what's involved in making a web application and uh, how to do that. You need to have at least a little bit of programming knowledge, but not super much. Um, we're gonna really start from as much of the basics as we as we can. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, we're actually gonna get started by just talking a little bit about um, some review. So you're trying to remember, you know, what are the, um, what are some of the basics of, uh, let's see if I can zoom my text in. I'm gonna go ahead and go into split screen. I apologize in advance. Um, I cannot figure out on Linux how to get my monitor to be the same size. So it's a little bit zoomed out there, but I will just make the text a little bit bigger to, com to compensate. And we're just gonna edit a random file so that we can talk a little bit about some of the stuff. So we're gonna start with, um, with again, a, a review of what uh, sort of a web application is, what is HTML, what is HTTP, that sort of stuff. So we're gonna start out with um, just a discussion of HTML. Can I make that any bigger? I can, but uh, it kind of works. Okay, so HTML. Um, many of you probably heard of HTML, even if you're not a programmer, maybe you've, you've tried to make a website before, something like that. Um, you have some basic information on how that works. Um, I'm just gonna, is this okay volume level? Let's see if I can bump this up a little bit more. Mike, Mike, one, two, cool. Okay, hopefully that's a little bit better. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and, and talk a little bit about what HTML is. Um, just as, a, just as a reminder, HTML, uh, hypertext markup language, um, kind of a silly historical name more than anything, to be honest. Um, HTML is basically what we do when we wanna make a website. So if you wanna make a really static looking website, you know, it might look something like this. And for anyone who's in the Android development workshop earlier, uh, you'll recognize this again, this is all uh, you know, XML-like stuff. So you know, we have a head, um, we have a title, the title says hello, uh, and you know, then we have, oh, we forgot to close our head, then we have a body, and maybe we have like inside that body, you know, maybe we have a H1, which is the header, and it says, hi, I'm Tyler. Terrible capitalization. <laughs> and uh, this is what the web looked like back in, you know, the early um, 90s um, to some extent. Let me check and see, how's this audio doing? I think this is okay. Uh, feel free to post in the chat if the audio is being awful, but it seems to be okay right now. Cool. Um, so, you know, P, and then maybe it says, like, what's your name? And, you know, this is, again, this is kind of what the web looked like back in the 90s. Um, not particularly great, um, not, uh, you know, the most beautiful thing, but it works. And it's also the other important thing to remember about this is that it's static. Um, so as you've probably noticed, like there's nothing in here that would cause it to change. So that is HTML. Um, boring, right? Boring. This is what we had back in the 90s. We don't need this anymore. So that's the first thing I wanted to review. Um, we, of course, everything does still use HTML, but what we're going to do is we're going to make programs that generate the HTML dynamically. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But you do need to, to at least remember that HTML exists, but that we're not just gonna be creating static web pages um, anymore. We're gonna be doing programming on the web, which is cool. Uh, the other thing you might be aware of for doing dynamic sort of changing web pages is JavaScript. You've probably heard of JavaScript before. JavaScript runs on the browser. So I have you know this computer right here, and uh, this computer, if I were to put some JavaScript in my HTML, it's gonna run on this computer. But if I wanted to like store something in a database or um, you know, send, uh, what are some other things you might wanna do with the web? You know, send a friend request to someone else. I can't do that just on my computer. I need to do that somewhere else. So JavaScript is not gonna be super helpful. It'll be helpful for making things move around on the computer, but it, you know, it's not gonna be helpful for um, doing things that affect other computers, at least not yet. Um, there are other ways that we can do that and we might talk about them briefly at the end. The last thing I wanted to review is going to be um, how HTTP works. So, you know, you go to a web page, you type in um, oh, HTTP, you know, maybe you do HTTPS, which just means it's encrypted, but it's, it's going to look basically the same. 
um, srnd.org slash contact, right? It's a really basic website. And if I were to, to go to that, srnd.org slash contact. And you can see it loads, and you know there's all the pictures and, and so on and so forth. What the browser is actually doing when I request this web page is it's actually it's doing this. It's sending the following text: get slash contact. You can see where that comes from, right? That comes from right here. Get slash contact http slash one point one slash one point one. There we go. So you can see. Okay, first of all, we got http. It's saying that's what we're doing. 1.1, contact. Get means that it's not a post, basically. Um, we're not gonna go too into that right now, but the, the gist of it is basically that, um, you know, if you were to submit a form, you might wanna submit lots and lots of text. If you do a, you know, a post request, you can put some text um, that doesn't show up in the URL. If you do a get request, sort of everything you wanna send to the server has to be in the URL. So, you know, you might do contact um, name equals Tyler. Um, with a post request, you could do contact, um, you know, and then you put name equals Tyler somewhere else. So we'll talk about that too. And the other thing you'll notice, srnd.org doesn't show up anywhere. That's because when they originally made the web, they assumed that there would only ever be one computer, like one website per computer. And now we realize that that's not necessarily true. Um, so they sort of tacked it on by typing host srnd.org, and that goes underneath it. And that's it. Um, basically, you hit enter twice, and then it'll actually get the, the web page. So let's actually go ahead and uh, try that out. Um, we will do telnet example.org, and we're going to type this number 80. Don't worry if you don't know what that means yet. We'll talk about that in a second. And we will type get slash, meaning we don't want to, you know, it's not going to be slash contact. It's just going to be example.org. Get slash HTTP slash 1.1 host example. Dot org, hit enter twice, and there we go. You can see that the web server did respond. And you can see here that the web server responds in something that looks somewhat similar. So it says HTTP slash 1.1 200 OK. If you've ever heard 404 file not found, that would basically change this. That would, instead of saying 200 OK, it would say 404 file not found. Uh, it's got a bunch of other stuff, you know, what date is it, um, expiration date if you want to cache it bunch of stuff, how long it's going to be, and then it's going to include the HTML for the web page. Um, and if you go to example.com, you'll see that, you know, basically the source of this web page is what we just got back from that web server. It's kind of cool. So that's the gist of it is when we're doing um, a web request, we are essentially just making HTTP, you know, we're just sending text to the server. And it's in that very specific format. And when you talk about what is HTTP, it is that very specific format that is, you know, get slash, you know, slash contact or just slash or whatever it is. Um, HTTP TP slash 1.1 host example.com. And then, you know, the server responds with you know, HTTP slash 1.1, 200, OK, um, you know, some other stuff, and then HTML. That is essentially what we're doing, right? Um, but here's the cool thing. A lot of people think when they make websites, oh, I need to make a .html file, and I need to upload it somewhere, and then a web server is just going to take care of it. Well, what is a web server? A web server is just a program. When we talk about servers, another quick review, we're not talking about a specific computer. It doesn't need to be a fancy, expensive computer. Um, that is not what a web server is. When you think about those, you know, those data centers full of lots and lots of you know, computers, those are just computers that are made to you know, not be on your desk. They're sort of targeted to that specific use. But when we talk about servers, we're not necessarily talking about um, you know, it, it, there's nothing special about them other than that they're specially targeted to that use case. But anything that runs a um, anything that runs a program that is a server is a server computer. So I'm going to talk about server applications or server programs as things that you can run on your personal computer. And then let's say you know you build the next Facebook and you want to run them on servers. Well, you just run that program on a computer that's made for it. Basically, a computer that's made to go in a data center and be sort of standardized. 
Um, but we're gonna make a, what we're gonna do today is we're gonna make a server program. And what that server program is it gonna do is it's basically just gonna read this text and understanding the format, do something with it. So again, we get this format right here. Let's look at the really basic stuff. The really, really, really basic stuff. What's the most important thing in, in this entire format? Let's see if we can go back to here. Well, we got two things, right? This right here is gonna be the path. You know, it's that URL, it's that thing. If I go to srnd.org slash contact, it's gonna be slash contact. You know, if I go to srnd.org slash donate, it's gonna be donate. You know, if I go to, for example, codeday.org slash Seattle slash register, you can see that this is probably one of the most important pieces of text that we're gonna to need to deal with, right? Because this is the piece of text that is going to change what we wanna bring back to the user. And by the way, if you've ever you know gone to codeday.org and been like, oh man, did they make a HTML file for every single code day in existence and then a register page and they just copy and paste them? No, you know, again, it, what we've done is we have a program that looks at this particular field and it says, it sees slash Seattle, and it says, oh, okay, slash Seattle, that means I wanna get the information for the Seattle code day. And slash register, okay, that means I should show the registration page for that code day. So that's the main thing we're gonna to need to change. The other thing we need to change is this HTML slash HTML. You know, we're gonna, what content we return back to the, the user. Um, and you'll actually find, you don't actually need any of this. If you just return, you know, absolutely plain text, it'll display it just fine in the web browser. Web browsers are pretty good at dealing with whatever you throw at them doesn't have to be super pretty. So we're gonna go ahead and get started um, making that program, the web server program that'll actually deal with, you know, taking um, those things from the top, um, you know, the slash Seattle slash register or slash contact or whatever, and turning those into the responses, the HTML that the client is actually gonna get back. Um, we're gonna do that. Uh, I'm gonna use something called Cloud9. I'm gonna show you how to sign up for it really quickly. You get a free, um, version of Cloud9 if you are a member of Student RD. So we're gonna go to accounts.srnd.org and let's zoom in. Eh, it's not beautiful. Um, right here, there's this thing that says free Cloud9 account. Now, if you're not logged in, it'll make you log in. I, I am logged in, so it's not gonna make me log in. Um, but if you're not logged in, you're gonna have to either go ahead and sign up or sign into your SRD account, depending on whether you already have one. So again, that's account, let's type it in, account.srnd.org, and then click on free cloud nine account. It's gonna give you this really awful looking web page. We will make it look prettier in the future. I've already had people complain about that. That says, please visit mail.srnd.org for your cloud nine invite. So but when you click on that link, it, it will automatically send you an invite to cloud nine. So I'm gonna go ahead and go over to mail. And um, it's not actually in here, but um, that's because I've already invited myself. But you would normally, you probably only have one message unless you're a SRD volunteer, and it'll just say, welcome to Cloud9. You'll click it, you can go through the registration process there. The important thing is that it won't ask you for a credit card, which um, Cloud9 usually would. So I'm gonna go ahead and sign into my Cloud9 workspace, um, and then I'll give, you, I'll give you a few seconds to finish that registration process. Um, again, this is kind of, uh, let's, this is what you wanna do. Go to account.srnd.org, click on free Cloud9 account, um, click mail, register. It's gonna be rig, because it fits on the screen. That's what you wanna be doing right now. Um, Cloud9 basically is this really cool thing. I think they got bought by Amazon, which allows you to edit things in your web browser rather than downloading a bunch of programs. You could do all of this on your physical computer. I can run a web server on my computer. And in fact, if I go to like srnd.dev, you can see, okay, here's a version of student R&D stuff, but it's not on the web. This is my own local development version of it. It's running on this computer. So again, I wanna stress, you know, it doesn't need to be um, on the web, anything will work, right? I mean, it's, it's not that Cloud9 is special and that they have a web server. You could run this on your computer, but it's easier to tell you, go to Cloud9 than it is to tell you, okay, run this thing and then this thing and then this thing and then this thing. And by the way, it's all different depending on whether you're using PC, Mac, or Linux. So once you've got your Cloud9 account, what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a new workspace. Go ahead and click that. 
Workspace name, what do we want to call this? Well, uh, it doesn't really matter. Give it something with your name because I think it has to be unique. Let's zoom in a little bit. I think it has to be unique um, across the student R&D team. So I'm gonna call it um, Tyler Test 2. And description, hello. You know, it's not exactly the way you wanna go with things, but that's fine. Team, you can either say, choose don't set a team or choose SRD. it doesn't actually matter. And then public or private, again, it's up to you. If it's public, um, everyone can see it. If it's private, only people you choose to share it with can see it. So if you're working on you know, the next hit startup and you really don't want anyone to know what it's gonna be, you can go ahead and choose private, but otherwise you can choose public. Um, let's go ahead and while people are still getting this set up, pop out the chat. Let's see if there's any questions. Uh, I don't see any, cool. And I'll go to just the screen so it's a little bit easier to see. So the next thing we're gonna to wanna to do, um, scroll down here, clone from Git or Mercurial. You can leave this blank. Um, if you know what you're doing, this is cool for you. Um, but if you don't know what you're doing and this is, and you're really in this workshop because you're a total beginner, uh, you can go ahead and ignore that for right now. Um, now, what do we wanna choose? Well, we talked about Python earlier. I said we were gonna make this in Python, but Python itself is just a programming language and we would have to tell it how to parse all that text. Remember, when we're talking about HTTP, we're just talking about some text, but we would have to write the code for parsing that all out. We'd have to write a bunch of other stuff. There are people who've already done that, and they made this really cool framework called Django. It's Python-based, but it will make it much easier for you to do other things. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and choose Django, and then we'll hit Create Workspace. And we'll just give it a second, and it'll do whatever it does, and. Uh, you know, all of these things, and we'll have a workspace. What it's actually doing is creating a full version of Linux that is installed and it's just for you. Um, so you can actually install new things, you can delete the entire hard drive, and this will be a, you know, this is running in the cloud. You can't quite see it, um, but I made air quotes. So this is running in the cloud. Um, basically on a computer somewhere else, they've initialized a whole new operating system just for you um, that you can do whatever you want with, which is cool. Um, it's a great way to play around with things if you don't know what you're doing. But um, you can see, okay, there's all this stuff, whatever, blah, blah, blah. We're gonna ignore all this for right now and just right up here in the top, we're gonna hit run project. And it's gonna do a bunch of stuff. And then it gives me this completely legible thing. Actually, it looks better on that screen. Um, and it's got a URL, and if I click that URL, it opens a new tab, and hit open the app, and it worked. Cool, we made a web website. We're done, this is it. That's it, thank you. Um, obviously, that's not gonna be um, all we're looking for, so let's go ahead and close this. Um, what we're gonna wanna do is actually customize this website in some sense, and we'll, we'll talk about how to do that. Now, one of the things that I always like to stress whenever we're doing a workshop like this is that part of being a programmer is learning to search for the right things and ask the right questions. And so I didn't make any notes for myself on how to do this. I've made a Django app in the past. Um, by the way, Django, but it's spelled Django. So I'm not sure what language that is, but it's fun. Um, one of the things that's important with being a programmer is learning to Google things. So I've made a Django app before, but I don't really remember a lot of it. I did go through this yesterday, so I know generally what I'm doing, but um, I didn't make notes specifically to show you, okay, this is how we would do things as a normal programmer. Now, what I would normally do is I would do a Google search for Django and then whatever we're looking to do. So what's the first thing we're looking to do? Okay, we're looking to customize the page. Before I even go to Google, let's see what we got here. We've got this init.py, oh, there's nothing in here. Okay, good to know. Settings, Let's see if I can make the text bigger. Font size, increase font size. I know that it says that there's hotkeys, but I don't think they'll work because of the specific way I have my browser set up. So we'll just do this a few times for fun while people are catching up. And to do. You don't need to do this, of course. I'm doing this so that you can see the text a little bit bigger. Let's see if this does work. Nope, doesn't. Okay, well, it's a little bit easier to read the text now, so that's good. Um, and we can even close out of this for right now. We're not gonna need it until later. 
So we got, okay, we got settings.py, blaz, ton of stuff. Ton of stuff. Probably don't need to do anything with this for right now. I suspect that when we need this, we'll know we need it. We got urls.py. Let's go ahead and just remove this comment to make it a little bit clearer. So we get some URLs. There's a slash admin, and it does something there. And then we got this WSGI, and again, it doesn't look like we need anything. Now, URLs. That's what we were talking about earlier, right? We were talking about how um, in HTTP there was that section, you know, up near the top where it was like get, um, let's see this this way, get slash, you know, HTTP slash 1.1. Those were the three sections. And then that slash could be, you know, slash admin or slash contact or slash Seattle slash register. Um, in this case, when we're looking at the URL patterns, we see it's slash admin. And that starts to tell me, okay, maybe something is going on there. Maybe there's some sort of admin page. Now, Django, again, is, is a framework. And what a framework means is uh, when we talk about frameworks, we're talking about something that um, comes with a lot of built-in code. It's not its own programming language, but it comes with a lot of built-in code so that you don't have to do certain things. Um, and it looks to me like Django has an admin page. So let's change our URL. I'll do it up here so that it makes sense. Slash admin. Let's see what, what comes up. Oh, there's this whole administration page. That's cool. So that is uh, a thing. Um, I don't know what our username and password is, so let's figure out. Django default admin login. This is how programming works. Username admin. OK, well. Eh, this looks complicated. Let's go to a simpler web page. If you Google for something and you come up with a web page, it's got just a ton of stuff. Just go to a different one, unless you absolutely need to. Okay, so it looks like we need to run this command if we want to get into the admin page. I'm not going to worry about that for right now, but it's good to know Django does have its own built-in admin. That's pretty nice of it. You know, we don't have to do that. It's already there. But we want to make our own website, right? That's what we were talking about you know, earlier when I was like, okay, we're done. We have this It Works page. That's not quite what we're looking for. We're looking for something a little bit you know, more customized. So instead, let's just go ahead and you know, let's just leave this here and leave this here. But let's fill this out for ourselves. So what do we want to do? What's the simplest web page? Let's make a slash hello. Now, what function is this going to run? That's the other question. Um, the answer to that is we tell it what function to run. So whenever someone goes to slash hello, is this, what did it look like? Hello, yeah, okay. Whenever someone goes to slash hello, we want it to run a specific function. We can even get rid of this import admin because we're not using admin anymore. Where is that function gonna be created? Well, we'll make a new function. So we're gonna make a new folder, a new file, sorry, and we will call it, um, let's call it views dot py for it's a Python file. Why is it called views? We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, to make a new function in Python, we run def. And let's see if I can make this a little bit bigger. And I'll also switch to just sharing the screen. Def hello. Um, and we want to return some text, right? Now, this won't work, and I'll show you what we do when we find it, it won't work, but I'll just give you that spoiler alert, it won't work. Um, go ahead and save. We'll go back into our URLs, and now we need to somehow reference this views hello. So what we want to do is from test, from Tyler, sorry, Tyler test2 import views. Where did Tyler test2 come from? Again, that's the name of our project. And views.hello. Don't put parentheses here. We don't want to call the hello function in here. What we want to do is we want to reference the fact that the hello function exists. So I know that might be a little bit confusing if you haven't done that, but basically, you know how you have variables? Um, at some points, you can kind of treat uh, functions also as if they're variables, or at least in some programming languages, and Python is one of them. So it's almost like hello is a variable and it's assigned to a function. So hello is going to call views.hello. We'll go ahead and hit stop. And we'll hit run again. This is all changes saved. And then we'll go to slash hello. I think we should get an error. Yep. Hello takes no arguments, one given. Okay. 
So what's going on? Well, these functions that we're creating to do specific pages, in Django, Django has a specific format they're accepting, expecting them to be in. So what we'll do is, again, we were talking about how we want to do Google searches a lot when we're a programmer. Let's search for Django simple view. Okay, do we have an example? Perfect, we do. Look at this. This is a, an example that gives you the current thing. So we can see, okay, we get the function name, we already get that, but oh look, it takes a parameter, it's called request. Um, request is a really general sounding name. It kind of makes sense that maybe the request is whatever the user sent. So let's go ahead and request. This will take a variable. Now it's just like any other function, we could call this something else, we could call it Q. And just to prove it, let's call it Q, but we know it's a request. Um, now what's the other thing? Okay. Instead of just returning plain HTML, we need to return it inside of this thing called HTTP response, and that needs to be imported. So we'll go ahead and copy and paste that. Again, it doesn't necessarily matter that you know exactly what's going on with a lot of this. Um, the important thing is, this is what Django wants you to do. And later on, maybe you'll start to do more complicated things, and you'll be like, oh, now I understand why HTTP response has to be wrapped around hello world. Why, you know, again, this is a function call. So we're calling HTTP response and we're passing in the argument hello world. Well, maybe the answer for that is because maybe sometimes we want it to be a 404 file not found error instead of a, you know, web page, which I suspect is one of the things that they do. But for right now, you know, we found, we searched for something, we found the, the code that we were looking for. We are just going to go ahead and make our code look like that and see if it works. So we'll go ahead and stop, start this, refresh the web page, and it works. That's cool. And you know, if I go to a different web page, random gibberish, page not found, 404. So what we've done is we've got um, this go ahead, going and calling this function. That is essentially what is going on, and that, I think, is pretty cool. So we have just made the simplest version of a um, of a, you know of a website. Which is pretty cool. Um, now, what else would we potentially want to do? Okay, so we got this. Um, that's just returning some plain old HTML. Really boring. It's not even returning HTML. I mean, it's literally just returning text, right? So maybe we want to make it a web page instead of just some text. So what we'll do, you know, we can wrap HTML. Body. And you know, now we've made this web page a little bit more exciting. We'll go ahead and stop, start, and refresh the page. And now we've made it a little bit more exciting. Now, why does this work? Well, because again, remember, we don't have to create a .html web page on the server in any specific place. What we just need to do so we just need to have it return some HTML. And that's what we've done. Again, as far as this is concerned, all I'm doing is returning some HTML. That's it. The web browser does not know whether this is running a program or not. All it knows is it knows how to speak HTTP and it does that and it gets back some HTML and then it knows how to display the HTML on the page. That's all it needs to know how to do. It doesn't need to know how to do anything else. So cool, we made our, our kind of boring web page. Um, less boring than before. Well, what if we want to make a new one? Hello 2. And again, in Django, all of these um, things take a single parameter called request. So we turn in an HTTP response. This is page 2. OK. And then we need to add another URL pattern. URL hello2 use dot hello2. Go ahead and stop, restart. If we refresh this web page, here we go. It's the same. If we go to slash hello2, eh, it didn't quite work. So why didn't this quite work? Well, I think that's because. Um, it's actually matching. So this is good to know. This is the sort of things that you also have as a programmer. It's like, okay, what's going on here? Why isn't this working? What it's doing is it's actually seeing this and all it's looking for something is something that starts with hello and then 
anything after it. It's not checking the entire thing. How do we make it check the entire thing? I think this will work. We'll see. Don't worry about exactly what's going on there, but it's regex. Let's see, it does. Um, this is regex, and regex, um, which is a way of matching strings. The caret means beginning, and the dollar sign means end, which means a string that begins with hello and ends with hello. You know, like basically nothing else. It's this is the entire string. Um, you can do other cool things too. Um, maybe you just want anything that starts with an H to match. Um, you know, you could do that. Or maybe you want an H with two other characters after it. You could do that. Um, but for right now, hello, hello too. Let's make all of our URLs like this just to be a little bit fancier. Stop. Start. Refresh, and you can see, hello two works. Hello works. Cool. We have a web page. Still not very exciting. Let's make this bigger too. Okay. Well, let's make some more functions. What are some other things we can do with a function? We could make it return a random number. Let's make a page called random. Now, how do we get a random number in Python? Well, let me tell you. I don't remember. So, Python random number. Eh, this is really long. So again, what I usually do, if a page is really long, try to find a shorter one first. It'll usually be helpful. Okay, looks like we have to copy this line. And again, this is a little bit contrived. I actually did know how to make a random number in Python. I've done that enough times, but um, this is a lot of what programming is, especially as you're learning something. And that doesn't necessarily mean that when you're learning programming, you do this a lot, and when you are a programmer, you don't ever. What it means is that I've done enough web applications that I probably remember how to get a random number. I've done enough Python applications in general that I probably remember how to get a random number. But, uh, I'm switch over to my. But the important thing is not that I, you know, know how to get a random number. The important thing is there are always going to be things that I am going to need to know how to do that I don't know how to do right now. So yeah, some of this stuff is really easy for me because I've been doing this for a while. But if you ask me a more complicated question, like how would you, um, you know, build in? Well, even do something that I don't know. Build an iOS application. I don't even know where to start. Never done it, right? The um, Android Studio thing that uh, Fedor taught before this. I actually was Fedora's teacher in the high school class that he took last year, and um, I didn't know anything about Android Studio. Fedora didn't know anything about Android Studio, and we kind of figured it out. And when he needed help, I just you know helped him figure out how to Google things. So yeah, I do know how to make a random number in Python, but the important thing is that you know with programming, you do get in the habit of okay, I don't know how to do this, but I can learn which is important. So let's go back here. Um, again, we're going to call this randint function that we um, imported. And let's say we want a random int between 0 and 1,000. Go ahead and save, stop, start. And oh, this isn't going to work. Well, why? Because we made a function, but we didn't make a URL. We didn't tell it where to go. The reason for that is Django doesn't just look for function names. It needs to be, have, be very, you need to be very explicit about what it's mapped to. So for example, even though this is called random, maybe the URL is called random number. You know, it doesn't need to match exactly. It doesn't need to match at all. Um, because what we're doing right here is we're telling Django and we're telling Python at some level, oh, hey, this matches with this. Again, remember Django is just a bunch of Python code that's pre-made for you, so you don't have to deal with it. I'm gonna go ahead and stop and save as well. Start. And we will go to our, do it up here. Random number page. Ah, there we go. Now, the cool thing about this is that, again, if this were a page on the server, just a static HTML web page, you wouldn't be able to change this number. But because this is just running a function every time the page is loaded, we can just refresh it. That's cool, right? Okay, so now we have that. 
So we have a bunch of things. This is the most useful web application. We have random number, we have the hello page, we have the hello to page. But um, let's say we want to do some other things. So what are some other things we can do given this is a server? Well, this is a program running on the server again, remember. So let's have a um, set my name function. And for right now, that'll be blank. And let's make a new URL. And let's even do some folders this time. Folders is in quotes, because again, we're not actually, these aren't real folders. These are just telling Python what functions to call. But let's say name slash set, set my name. Okay, we wanna remove those parentheses, even though it oh, just went back. Hang on. We will go, did I, what's going on here? Okay. Go ahead and open this again. Don't know entirely why I did that, but that's fine. Give it a second for everything to load. Set my name. And then we're gonna make another function called get my name. Okay. So for right now, let's just say, and the other, the other thing we're gonna do is we're gonna to wanna to make a variable, right? Because in this case, we wanna set something, we wanna get something, and be, we can make a variable and we can change it because again, this is just code running on a Python program. So we're gonna make a new variable, it's gonna be called my name, and right now it's gonna be equal to Bob, which is not my name. Cool. And when we call set my name, we'll change my name to Tyler. We're gonna do it the simple way first and then we'll talk about how to do it in a second the more complicated way. We're going to return my name was set. And when we call get my name, we're just going to return my name is my name. And in fact, the better way to do this in Python is this, which will replace the first um, set of the curly brackets with the first parameter and so on and so forth. Um, but don't worry about that for right now. That's what we're going to use. Is this going to work? Looks like it's working. Go ahead and close that. Um, oh, one more thing we forgot. We forgot to do URL name get. So we'll go ahead and save that. Stop, restart, and we'll call name get first of all. And let's see what we get. My name is Bob. That is incorrect. So we're going to set my name. It's set. We'll go back to get. And that doesn't work as well as I thought it would. OK. Um, hmm. Why doesn't that work? I am not totally sure why that doesn't work. Um, it looks like this cannot override this, or probably more likely whenever I make a request, it's actually running this entire thing, um, I guess. Right, is that what's going on? I guess that's what's going on, okay. Well, I should have tested this beforehand, so that's not gonna work. Um, but in theory, it is actually setting these variables. Um, I could do something like, my name was set to .format my name. And in this case, when we call set, it's going to say it was set to top. Um, let's go ahead and do this then. Let's remove this. Go back into URLs, remove this. And for right now, we'll just do this. Uh, so here's another thing we want to do. Sometimes in, you, know, you want to send data to a server, right? The way that we often do that is we do the question mark name equals Tyler. And that's what we want to do in this case. I don't know why this isn't entirely working. Um, we're going to set name equals Tyler. What we want to do then is we want to somehow have the page show whatever we passed in. So if I set my name to X because I'm super cool, we want it to show that. How do we do that? Well, we need to get whatever the user was sending. So let's search for Django. 
um, get HTTP, uh, get URL parameter. And how do we do it? It looks like this is not what we want. Um, request dot get dot whatever the name is. So in this case, it's name. You know, we're passing in this parameter called name. And if we want to get our name, request dot get dot name is apparently the way it works. So let's go ahead and try it. Um, okay, so that was not actually true. Request.get.get. Okay, let's try that. Sometimes software changes and things work differently. So we want to get the name. Stop, restart, Let's see if this works. There we go. And let's even change the text a lot. Name is. Go ahead and refresh. My name is X. Again, I can say my name is Tyler. My name is Bob. And so on and so forth. So that's kind of the, you know, again, that's kind of the gist of this entire thing is um, we can take text and from the user and we can turn it into function calls. So again, instead of just having to map things over to, you know, static HTML web pages that you made, instead what we can do is we can actually create, um, uh, and so what we can do is we can actually create functions. And then we can say, hey, when the URL looks like this, call this function. When the URL looks like this, call this function. Um, which is, again, much more powerful than just creating static HTML web pages, because what it means is that we can do things more dynamically. Now, where would you want to go from here? I gave you kind of the absolute basics that you would need for making a web application. Um, and this is technically an application. There's code that runs when you request URLs. What are some of the next steps you're going to want to do? Well, first of all, um, one thing you might want to consider doing is uh, using a database. So I, there was actually a talk at the code break in the winter on how databases work. Um, might be worth revisiting, or um, you can do some searches for Python with databases. One of the cool things about um, Django is that it includes a built-in database. So I'd even recommend if you're going to use Django, just search for Django databases, and then there's a lot of information out there. Maybe even add the word tutorial so that you don't get super dense technical documentation. So I just search for Django database tutorial, see if you can find something there. Again, D-J-A-N-G-O. Um, and then, you know, maybe you can start creating a users table and then putting in users and then you can actually track data associated with them. Um, what are some other things you might want to do with this? Well, you probably don't want to have everything in the URL. If you send a password, you probably don't want to keep that in the URL um, because that is bad because then it shows them in the browser history and it's like password equals, you know, Hunter2. Um, so another thing that you might want to look into is using Django with post requests. Um, because again, what I was telling you was get requests, when you send information, it goes in the URL. Post requests, it goes somewhere else. Um, and in general, whenever you're doing anything that is more sensitive or changes data, you probably want to use a post request for that. So that's something else that you could Google for. Now, the other thing is you don't have to use Django. You can also use um, other languages as well. Uh, if you're already familiar with Java, that is the one that I would recommend not using. Um, the reason just being starting a web server in Java. Java is a very enterprisey programming language, and starting a web server in Java is a little bit more complicated than I think it should be. Um, but if you use like C Sharp, which is similar to Java, um, that's a good option. Uh, you can use Go is a popular one. You can use Node.js if you're into JavaScript. Um, you can use um, what are some other programming languages people use? I don't know. Ruby um, and Ruby on Rails is a popular framework for it as well. You can also just use plain Python. And if you want to, if you want something that's even simpler to get the hang of, um, Python has this really cool web framework called Flask. Let's go ahead and go to that one. Uh, 
And uh, Flask is even simpler. Rather than having those multiple files, this is the entirety of the code for Flask. From Flask, import Flask. App equals Flask underscore underscore name underscore underscore. And then, you know, if we want to have a slash, um, you know, if we want to route to slash test, it's just slash test. Um, so Flask is even easier. Um, if you're building a complicated application, maybe not as good of an option, but for a simple one, definitely a great option. All programming languages, for the most part, have some framework um, like this that's a really easy way to get a web application running. Um, the important thing really is just, you know, break it down into what pages do you need, um, build the pages, those sort of things. One more thing you might want to consider when you're building a web application that we're not going to get into today is how do you um, create, you know, if every page looks exactly the same. Let's go to, um, what's an example? Let's go to srnd.org slash contact. You know, it's got, our website has the same nav bar at the top and you go to press, and the nav bar is the same, this is the same, this is the same, it's just a different image and different text. If you go to the donate page, that's all the same. If you go down to the trademarks page, that's pretty similar. You know, if you go to bug bounty page, again, it's pretty similar. The footer's the same. All those things are kind of the same. How are you gonna wanna do, um, how are you gonna wanna do that? How are you gonna wanna, you know, not have to recreate this every single time? The answer is um, templates. And that's another thing that Django is really great at. So you might want to search for Django templates. And then you can have one page that's your template page and then have all the other ones um, sort of use that template. And it works a lot like templates in PowerPoint or something else. Um, yeah, so that is pretty much it for this. Um, if you have any questions, I am happy to take them now. Otherwise, if you do start you know, working on your application and you have some questions that come up, as always, um, chat.srnd.org. Um, you can join our chat and uh, ask questions there. There are people there to help you, assuming you're a student of some sort. And uh, the other options for getting help are to tweet me at Tyler Menezes. Um, it was in the video earlier, how to spell my last name. Um, but with that in mind, I'm gonna go ahead and check and see if there are any other questions. And then after that, we are going to go ahead and get set up for the Unity um, workshop. Uh, yeah, chat is usually pretty quiet. People don't ask a lot of questions on here. Um, but I think that's just because people are always hesitant to ask questions. I also, the chat is broken today for a lot of people apparently. Um, like I have to keep refreshing the page whenever I wanna see if the chat is updated because the live server doesn't seem to work. So, cool. Well, I am going to go ahead and end this, uh, this session. And then again, there is a Unity workshop coming up in just about 10 minutes if you're watching this live. Um, if you're watching a recorded version, it should already be recorded. So thank you so much for, for tuning in and uh, we'll see you soon. Oh, it's tabbed out of it.